What does logic look like when we have sentences that are neither true nor false? What does logic look like when we've got sentences that are both true and false? Let's find out. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Attic. We have been talking about non-classical logics, three-valued logics, part one of that. It's just here. Go and have a look at that if you haven't already. In this video, we are going to be using what we learned in the previous video, understanding the connectives in terms of three truth values, and we're going to be building that up into three-valued logics. If you are enjoying the non-classical logics and you want to hear more, why not subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon to get updates. We are continuing talking about three valued logics. In the previous video, we looked at how to extend our truth tables uh, for the connectives, not, and, or, if, then, to the three valued case. Okay, so how do we make sense of them when we've got this third truth value, other, floating around. So truth matrices look like this. Here's the one for conjunction. Here's the one for disjunction. And then we saw two different approaches to if then, the implication. This one is the strong Kleene matrix. This one is the Wukasevitz matrix. They only differ on what value they give to the case where both A and B are other. In the strong Kleene case, it gets an O. In the Wukasevitz case, it gets a T. In this video, we're going to look at logics that you can get once you put all of these matrices together. We're going to look at three of these logics, strong Kleene logic, Wukasevich logic, and the logic of paradox. So a nice easy way into these logics is to say what sentences do they make valid? So let's start off by looking at the concept of validity. In classical logic, validity just means a sentence that's always true. So let's just stick with that. Let's just say in our three-valued logic, we've got these three values, true, false, and other, and let's say that a sentence is valid when it always takes the value true. So let's start off with strong Kleene logic. So here we're going to use the table for negation and or and the strong Kleene table for if then. OK, that's this one here. What sentences does this make valid? Well, we've already seen that it's not going to make A arrow A valid because when A takes the value other, then we've got an O here and here and the whole thing takes the value other. So it's not always true when A is other. If A, then A will be other. So this thing isn't valid in strong Kleene logic. What about that other central validity of classical logic, A or not A? Well, that's not going to be valid either. Because again, when A takes the value other, not A will also take the value other. So we've got other or other, and the value of that is other. OK, so this can take the value other. It's not always true, so it's not valid in strong Kleene logic. In fact, if you think about it, nothing's going to be valid in strong Kleene logic. Because when sentences start taking the value other, that value bubbles up through all the compounds. There's always a way of making a sentence other. And that means no sentence is going to be valid. So there are going to be sentences that are never false. In particular, this is never false. There's no way of making that sentence false. And there's no way of making that sentence false. If you make a false, that's true. So that's true. And if you make a true, that's false. But then the whole thing's still true. There's no way of making this false, but it can be other. Similarly with this one. And if we're taking validity to mean always true, these sentences won't be valid. No sentence will be valid in K3. What about Wukasevich three-valued logic? So here we take the same matrix for negation and an or, but we change the matrix for implication to the Wukasevich table. That's this one. It's the one where we put a T right in the middle value. So now when we've got A arrow A, that is guaranteed to be true. Because if A is false, it's going to be true. If A is true, it's going to be true. And that middle value, if A is other, we've got O arrow other. And in the Wukasevich case, that is true. So this sentence is guaranteed to be true. It's valid in Wukasevich logic. But again, A or not A, excluded middle, that's not going to be valid. Because again, if A is other, then not A is other. So the whole thing will be other. 
Okay, so the reason why these kind of sentences, law of excluded middle, don't come out valid is because we have this other value, right? There is this middle value. Excluded middle is designed to rule out this third value. Since we've got this third value floating around, and given the way that we're counting sentences as being valid when they're always true, excluded middle won't be valid. Okay, it's not valid in strong Cleely logic, and it's not valid in Wukasevich logic. Okay, so there we've looked at two logics, strong Cleany logic, Wukasevich three-valued logic. They're pretty much the same. They just treat implication in a slightly different way so that AROA, valid in Wukasevich, not valid in strong Cleany logic. Now let's come on to the logic of paradox. Now this is going to be a little bit different. Here, we're not just going to change how we're going to treat implication. In fact, we're going to do it in the strong Cleany way. What we're going to change is what we count as being valid. So classically, we say a valid sentence is one that is always true. Or we might say it's a sentence that can never be false because always true, never false. That means the same thing in classical logic. But when we've got three values, they come apart, right? A sentence might not always be true, even though it's never going to be false. So we've got two different criteria here. We might say always true like we did with Strong Cleany and Wukasevich. But there's another option. We might take a sentence to be valid when it can't ever be false. That's what we do in the case of the logic of paradox. OK, so we're now going to say that a sentence counts as valid when it can't ever take the value f. It always avoids being false. That's the idea behind the logic of paradox. What does it make true? What does it make valid? Well, given the kind of reasoning that we went through before, it's going to make both the law of excluded middle and self-implication valid. OK, because we said when A is false, not A is true. So this sentence is true. When A is true, this sentence is true. And when A is other, this sentence is other. So it can't ever be false. So it's valid in this expanded sense of validity. What about AROA? Well, again, there's no way of making that false. In fact, it doesn't matter which truth table we take for the arrow there, whether it's the strong Cleany one or the Wukasevich one. On either approach, there's no way of making that sentence false. Interesting fact, every sentence that is valid in classical logic is going to be valid in the logic of paradox. And that's basically because as you add these new truth values, you don't add any extra cases of falsity. OK, so when we added other, we added new ways in which a sentence could be other. OK, so a sentence could avoid being true in this new other way. And that's why sentences like the law of excluded middle don't end up being valid in K3. But we don't add any new ways of being false. OK, so you allow a sentence to take this new value. It doesn't mean it's going to end up being false. It just means it's going to end up being either true or other. So counting validity in this expanded sense by saying a sentence is valid when it is either true or other, i.e. it's never false, all of the classically valid sentences are still going to be valid in the logic of paradox. Huh. OK, that's interesting. So we kind of just said that our way of characterizing what a logic is, is through the sentences it makes valid. But if classical logic and the logic of paradox make valid the same sentences, how come they're just not the same logic? So we're going to have to go a little bit deeper here and think not just in terms of validity, but also in terms of entailment. What kind of entailments do we get in the logic? And if you think about it, this is going to be a good way to go for the other logics as well, because we said in K3, nothing's valid. But it's not like nothing happens in the logic. There's still going to be entailments even in K3. For instance, conjunctions will entail their conjuncts. A disjunct will entail a disjunction that it's part of. So really, we need to think about entailment rather than just validity to make sense of three valued logics. OK, so let's have a think about how we handle entailment when we've got this third truth value floating around. So let's go back to classical logic. If we've got some premises and a conclusion, we want to rule out the case where the premises are true and the conclusion's false. So we might say that entailment is all about truth preservation. If the premises are true, then the conclusion had better be true as well. 
Alternatively, we might say it's about falsity avoidance, right? So if the premises avoid being false, then the conclusion had better do it as well. Classically, they mean the same thing. But again, in three-valued logic, these things come apart. So there's going to be some property that we want preserved from premise to conclusion. Is it being true? So if the premises are true, the conclusion is also true. Or is it not being false? So in other words, if the premises avoid being false, the conclusion had better avoid being false as well. In the three-valued setup, those two different ways of characterizing it come apart. OK, there's ways of avoiding being false that don't map onto being true. You might be other. OK, if a sentence takes the value other, it has avoided being false, but it hasn't yet made it to being true. So in the case of K3 and Wukasevich three-valued logic, we're going to do things in terms of truth preservation. OK, so premises entail the conclusion just in case on all valuations, if the premises are true, then the conclusion had better be true as well. OK, so that captures K3 and Wukasevich 3. And then validity is a special case when there's no premises. We just say the conclusion that always takes the value T. The logic of paradox is going to do it in this more expansive sense. For all valuations, if the premises all take a value other than T, then the conclusion takes a value other than T. In other words, if they avoid being false, then the conclusion also avoids being false. And again, this ties in with this logic of paradox expanded notion of validity, because then we're saying there's no premises and the conclusion never is false. It always avoids being false. It always takes a value either T or O. So philosophically, why would you want any of these logics? Well, if you think there are genuine cases out there where sentences are neither true nor false for whatever reason, then you're going to want one of these logics that allows sentences to be neither true nor false, K3 or Wukasevich 3. On the other hand, what about sentences being both true and false? Well, that tends to get applied to paradoxes. Paradoxes seem to imply that a sentence is both true and false. And one response to that is to go, yeah, it is. It really is both true and false. But we've got a logic that handles that. So we're going to be talking a little bit about paradoxes and how the logic of paradox tries to diffuse the philosophical problem. OK, guys, so that is a really brief introduction to the really exciting, fascinating world of three valued logics. I'm going to be talking plenty more about these kind of topics on the channel in the future. So if you want to hear about that, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon to get updates. If you've got questions about this, leave me a comment down below. It will be great to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching this far. I will see you next time. <laughs>